Hello everyone. Welcome to the gout section of PHA 430. Gout is one of my favorite topics to teach uh, for a few reasons. The drug classes are, are relatively straightforward. They make a lot of sense. The mechanisms correlate very well with the clinical utility. Um, and also a lot of a lot of what I discuss relates to my res my dissertation research from grad school. Um, especially the uric acid transport in the kidney. Okay, so I'm not going to read through the learning objectives, um, but they're actually very pertinent um, to the exam material and um, to all the, the real content, uh, the body of the material. So I'd like you to at least look through those once and consider the learning objectives. Okay, so um, as you can see, this is one of our simplest uh, drug indices. It's only a few different classes. We have the xanthine oxidase inhibitors. Allopurinol is a very old drug that's very useful. Febuxostat is a new, a relatively new drug in the same class. Uricosuric drugs, which just help uh, in elimination of uric acid uh, renally. Probenicid is the only one in the United States that's used and uh, currently on the market. Anti-inflammatory agents, because gout involves so much inflammation and pain. Of course, we're going to see anti-inflammatories. NSAIDs are certainly not foreign to anyone uh, listening for the most part. Now, colchicine, you really won't see that being used in, in other disease states. Colchicine, I'll get more a little bit more into detail on that in a little bit. Uh, but again, colchicine, you won't really see it anywhere else. Um, it's used at a very low dose, and it's got a niche for this uh, disease state. And a new agent, which is exciting for me, is piglotacase or Cristexa. I like the fact that um, it kind of uh, it targets a portion of uric acid metabolism um, that for many years when I discussed it, I would say essentially I wish we had something that worked here. Um, and now we finally do, which is kind of exciting. Okay, so we'll get into that in a little bit. Okay, so I want to start off. Um, because it's it's going to be very important to do this to get into the the pathophysiology and the homeostasis of uric acid. Uh, first, I'll just say uric acid is the culprit of gout for the most part. So uric acid accumulation is what's going to cause gout. Okay. Um, so first, I want to talk about uric acid synthesis. Uric acid is made um, through DNA for the most part DNA breakdown. That's a pur purines in the DNA, so that's adenine and guanine. Okay, so certain foods will have more purines than other foods, and I'm not going to get into that at this point. Um, the a pharmacy practice faculty member will talk about that um, uh, fairly soon in the curriculum. So I'm not going to get into that, but you know, certain foods are going to be uh, involved, you know, having more uric acid or more purines than others, causing um, you know higher propensity for for gout. So I want to talk again about the synthesis pathway. So here's adenine, here's guanine. Okay, so again, those are the nucleotides, um, purine nucleotides in DNA. So what happens is, um, if you look here, this is where uric acid is. Okay, I want to focus on uric acid, okay, for this whole talk. So what happens is adenine, uh, from this direction, we have a, one more step, essentially. Adenine gets broken down to hypoxanthine and then into xanthine, okay, and then xanthine to uric acid. This enzyme, xanthine oxidase, is two steps in this pathway. Um, we have at least two drugs that can inhibit xanthine oxidase, and um, that's a very efficacious method for preventing the synthesis of uric acid, really the metabolism down to uric acid, okay. But uric acid um, also comes from guanine, but guanine skips the hypoxanthine step, we go right to xanthine. Okay, um, you'll notice that one of the drugs, uh, allopurinol, that's used for this, uh, for for inhibiting this synthesis of uric acid, kind of resembles xanthine. Okay, so it's able to block the enzyme uh, xanthine oxidase because it resembles xanthine. Okay, now most mammals, really most mammals, can break down uric acid into allantoin, and probably a lot of non-mammals. Okay, but most mammals can break down uric acid, and this allantoin is very water soluble. It's much less likely to, to precipitate or crystallize, um, 
which which is great for those species that can do that. Unfortunately, humans cannot do that. So great apes, um, I guess some would consider humans great apes. You can say humans and great apes. Um, that's the family hominidae. They do not have the ability to break down uric acid because they do not possess or express the enzyme uricase. Okay, so that's important to, to remember as we move on. Okay, some of you may not enjoy this, uh, but for me it's kind of fun and it's important to get into the physical chemical properties here of uric acid. So I'm going to talk briefly, if you bear with me, about uh, pKa and uh, not really the equation of henderson hasselbach but the idea. Okay, so blood uric acid, this is very important, blood uric acid reaches saturation at around 7 to 8 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so a lot of people that get these uh, stones that form um, and really the, the crystals form, we'll get into that later, but the crystals form in the joints for the most part, and they could form in other places as well. But these uh, crystals that form um, are much more likely to occur at higher levels of uric acid in the blood. So 7 to 8 milligrams per deciliter, you go above that, um, sometimes not even above that, uh, but the higher you get there, um, the higher risk of getting uh, crystals in the joints. So the pKa of uric acid is 5.75. Um, the way I look at anything is, is basically as soon as I see the number pKa, I go ahead and look at the structure to, to convince myself that I can identify the acidic group or the basic group on this structure. Now uric acid is a unique one because uh, I would say most, most people in the science realm look for a carboxylic acid or something else that's more common with drugs uh, for an acidic group, but the truth is uric acid doesn't have one of those. We actually have an acidic amine, which is quite rare for medications. Um, actually, this, obviously it's not a medication, but for small molecules, um, we see an acidic amine, which is quite rare actually. That acidic amine um, is essentially, that's the pKa that we're talking about, that value there. So contrary to what you might be used to, this amine, we're not really considering it um, in the sense of a positive charge. We're considering that we could form a negative charge. We deprotonate that amine. Okay, so at a plasma pH, um, normal pH of 7.4, uric acid is mostly ionized. Okay, so it's very soluble in water. At a pH of 4.75, um, uric acid is 91%, and that's just just kind of an arbitrary number, but showing you that an acidic pH, a lot of uric acid is unionized or insoluble in water, so it can crystallize. The pH, of course, is very important, or I wouldn't have brought that up. Um, so low pH or high acidity promotes crystal formation. That's very important to understand, um, and I'll just go off on a brief tangent, but it's kind of important, actually. Um, the idea that um, if you look on online or on TV, you'll, you'll see constantly people saying you should drink, you know, drink this or drink that, eat this or eat that to prevent kidney stones. Well, the reality is kidney stones are, um, they're not all the same. Some kidney stones are worsened by acid. Some kidney stones are improved by acid. Some kidney stones are improved by base or worsened by base. The only thing that you can you can pretty much bet on is more water is generally going to be better at preventing stones. Okay, so that you know that's yes we can get uric acid stones in gout, um, but honestly most of the symptoms stem from um, the precipitation in the joints uh, of uric acid. So briefly go over the mechanism of a gouty attack. So when the concentration of uric acid increases to to a point that's too high, crystals form. Uh, for some reason, it's often in the large toe, okay? Uh, I know uh, pharmacy practice faculty get into that a little, in terms of the symptoms, a little bit in more detail. Okay, that the crystals form in, usually in the big toe, okay? Um, the, the running theory here is that crystals are consumed or phagocytized by neutrophils and macrophages, okay? Um, these defense cells release inflammatory mediators, uh, such as prostaglandins and certain um, other cytokines, okay, which um, those, of course, increase inflammation and decrease the local pH. Remember, a lot of defense cells, when they um, 
release their um, innards, basically their, their enzymes and other compounds, um, we end up with an acidic environment. They often release acids. So the problem, the real problem here is, right, if, you, if you're if you're degranulating and releasing uh, an acidic substance in, in an area that has a lot of uric acid, it's already started to crystallize, um, you're actually worsening precipitation or crystal formation because you're going to lower the pH even more. Um, so you're, you're, you're ending up with a vicious cycle of inflammation, then more precipitation of uric acid, then more consumption by the macrophages of the crystals of uric acid and then more inflammation. And there's some evidence that uric acid crystals can actually rupture macrophages, causing them kind of prematurely to um, release enzymes, or even if not prematurely, um, to release their acid um, after they get ruptured. Okay. So what can we do to manage uh, gout? Okay. And the real question is what can we do to reduce the concentration of uric acid and to, to alleviate the pain and inflammation related to gout. Okay, so one option, um, pretty obvious selection here is to decrease the production of uric acid. So xanthine oxidase inhibitors can do that. We can increase the excretion of uric acid. Um, that's called uricosuric drugs doing that, okay, such as probenicid. Or we could, um, well, often we're doing this in parallel with one of these other uh, one and two. So number three would be limiting the inflammation associated with uric acid, such as um, using NSAIDs and colchicine, or sometimes together. Okay. So the xanthine oxidase inhibitors, in, again, include alpurinol and febuxostat. Okay. Um, this is this is kind of an FYI of some trivia, that alipurinol was originally used as an anti-cancer drug or anti-neoplastic because it's a purine antimetabolite. Okay, you'll notice that um, throughout the curriculum, a lot of medications were first tried for something else, and then we they, they discovered that they were better for another indication. And one of those um, common, actually a common indication that things are attempted on is cancers. Okay, so l is not a cancer drug, though. Now, it's, it's only a, a basically xanthine oxidase inhibitor for gout. So xanthine... Remember, that was the endogenous compound um, that is basically a precursor for uric acid. Xanthine resembles the drug allopurinol. Okay, so if you look down here, I'm highlighting the differences. Xanthine and allopurinol have an invert, essentially we've inverted the carbon and the nitrogen here. Okay, and we're missing this hydroxyl group on allopurinol. It turns out, um, perhaps by serendipity, but this structure... Okay, is 15 to 20 fold um, more, uh, or has 15, 15 to 20 fold higher affinity for xanthine oxidase than xanthine actually does. So it kind of competes that xanthine out of there. So instead of having uric acid metabolism, we have inhibition of xanthine oxidase. Okay, Fabuxostat is a novel, that's a novel non purine xanthine oxidase inhibitor, which does not really resemble xanthine. Okay, so allopurinol, um, this is getting a little bit of a deep, getting into a little bit of detail here, but allopurinol binds to and inhibits the active site of xanthine oxidase, whereas febuxostat doesn't really get into the active site, but it does block an important channel that would permit um, xanthine to get it into the active site. They're effectively both inhibiting the enzyme uh, xanthine oxidase by two slightly different mechanisms. Okay. This is perhaps not common knowledge, but allopurinol is metabolized in the active site of xanthine oxidase to oxypurinol. So it actually, uh, as you might expect, instead of just being an inhibitor, of course xanthine oxidase is treating it as a substrate. So it's converting allopurinol to oxypurinol. And oxypurinol has some affinity as well for xanthine oxidase, um, creating um, another compound that can inhibit the enzyme. Okay. Um, the nice thing is, even though when we block xanthine oxidase, we'll, of course, we'll have some accumulation of hypoxanthine and perhaps xanthine, uh, perhaps both of those, because we're blocking their metabolism. 
we're not really worried about those because um, they're very water soluble and very easily uh, renally excreted. Okay, in fact, renal clearance is much higher than that of uric acid. Okay, I'm going to go over the side effects very briefly. Um, one side effect, and this is mostly allopurinol. Fabuxostat is still relatively being kind of being tested. Um, some of these are going to be the same, uh, but these are mostly for allopurinol. We get sometimes a pruritic maculopapular rash. Um, that's kind of a fancy term, but all it means is, okay, um, intense itching, pruritic, maculopapular. That's a, that's kind of a, a hybrid term. That's m macules, meaning flat, discolored regions. It's a flat, kind of a flat rash, a uh, red rash that's flat, so you couldn't sense it if you had your eyes closed. Papules are. Uh, is the root word for this papular. So papules are actually raised uh, red kind of regions. So you have a combination of flat red and raised red regions kind of um, so we get a kind of a changing geography depending on uh, where you look and where you feel. So you get both of those. Okay, of course with most drugs nausea, vomiting, diarrhea are possible. Peripheral neuritis, so perhaps tingling in the fingers, maybe um, pins and needles, potentially. Okay, suppression of bone marrow can happen, so po potentially a reduction in some of the blood cell counts. Okay, not a definite and not necessarily very common. Cataracts, again, not extremely common. Something that's well recognized, okay, is that uh, allopurinol, or let me let me make this um, generalization. Really, anything that Anything that reduces uric acid concentrations rapidly has been shown to potentially produce a gouty attack when first started. And you'll hear from uh, pharmacy practice, uh, the pharmacy practice faculty member, Dr. Malinowski, that when you um, when you first start something that's going to lower uric acid, it's very important to make sure you have an anti-inflammatory on board in case there is a gouty attack. Now this uh, bullet A here, um, I would say this is not proven. This is more of a hypothesis. Perhaps more uric acid is mobilized from tissues when you decline the level very fast. When you decrease it, um, the hypothesis perhaps there's an overshoot of the blood concentration. Again, that's not proven. Okay, I would say that it's not, there's not a, a, a real confirmation as to why this occurs. Co-administration of colchicine, um, as I alluded to, that helps prevent the acute attacks. Um, something very important you'll see over and over again is the drug interaction with um, not just allopurinol, but also uh, febuxostat, um, any xanthine oxidase inhibitor, uh, because uh, the drug azathioprine okay, um, and 6 mercaptipurine, which they're actually in the same um, metabolic pathway, azathioprine is a prodrug metabolizes 6 mercaptipurine which is also a prodrug. Both of those drugs um, they do rely on xanthine oxidase for some of their metabolism. So if you block xanthine oxidase um, there's a very good chance you're going to have a higher um, effect and a higher toxicity of azathioprine and or 6 mercaptipurine. These can be used in gastrointestinal disorders um, often of 6 mercaptipurine 6 mercaptopurine for um, oncology. Okay, so these are pretty uh, kind of ubiqu not ubiquitous, but widespread use you'll see for these two different medications, different disease states. So just know that that drug interaction exists between xanthine oxidase inhibitors, which will increase the risk of toxicity for these two drugs. Okay, um, what this image is here is kind of just a refresher on. Um, essentially, the main, kind of the real main points about um, kidney function and how the kidney handles small molecules and, and molecules that are bound to protein, uh, for example. Um, so I, I, I love this image. I got this from the internet quite a long time ago, but I think it's very, very helpful um, to get. And of course, it's, it's just a drawing rather than a real image, but it's, it's really helpful to see what happens. So just as a refresher, um, this would be one kind of one glomerulus in one nephron and of course we have a million of these in each kidney so we have the afferent arteriole 
where um, for in each in each glomerulus we're going to have a feeding feeding afferent arterial, which goes into this bundle of capillaries, and then we have the efferent arterial where the blood leaves. Um, so a portion of uric acid um, is bound to plasma protein. Okay, I just want you to know that some of it is bound, not the exact number. And a portion of uric acid, of course, is freely floating in the blood. Okay, remember that anything bound to albumin, um, anything at all bound to albu albumin, will not be filtered at the glomerulus unless it comes off of albumin, unless it, it dissociates, which will happen um, because it's going to be in equilibrium. So if something is bound to albumin, it won't be filtered, and it'll continue to the efferent arterial. If something um, is free, and it's less than 65 kilodaltons uh, for the most part, um, it's a pretty standard number we use, then it will be fil filtered at the glomerulus. Okay. What's important to remember is that just because something is filtered here doesn't mean it's going to stay in the tubule. And just because something doesn't get filtered and goes throughout the bloodstream here, um, well, actually, it's the efferent arterial coming, it'll come back, and you can't see that here, come back to peritubular capillaries. Those peritubular capillaries um, will contain the uric acid that was not filtered and the uric acid that is bound to albumin. Well, both of those, um, not just the free uric acid, but also the bound uric acid can be secreted um, into the proximal tubule as well. Um, so just because something didn't get filtered doesn't mean it can't get secreted. Just because something got, got filtered doesn't mean it can't get reabsorbed. So uric acid can do both. It can get secreted and reabsorbed. Humans have to, happen to be very good reabsorbers, and that's why we have a problem. Uh, because even if you filter uric acid, a lot of it goes back into the bloodstream through reabsorption. Okay, and that's going to be um, real background material for understanding how the uricosuric drugs work. Okay, um, this is really just um, kind of the discussion that, that I just had about all this. Um, so this is kind of, if you missed anything, you can go through this um, narrative to understand, uh, you know, more detail what was going, what basically I was discussing up there. So now something hopefully more useful is to look at um, the actual image here that a simple image I made on, on PowerPoint of, um, again, this is a cartoon of one tubule, a proximal tubule, um, and it, just a few paratubular capillaries. Remember that they come after the efferent arterial, okay, um, so after we pass the glomerulus. So what can happen here, and um, this is not necessarily um, taught in every pharmacology course, but I think it is important to understand this because it kind of helps you understand why there's a dose dependence on efficacy of uricosuric drugs like probenicid. Um, so this is where I get to talk a little bit about my, my research. Um, I, in grad school, I studied organic, organic anion transporter 3, which is on the basal lateral membrane of the renal proximal tubular cells, um, these epithelial cells. It just so happens that um, the drug that we're talking about here, probenicid, blocks OAT3 and also OAT1, okay, even though those are separate transporters, I have them shown as the same one here. It doesn't it's really not that critical to know that. But both of these transporters are blocked by probenicid. Uh, probenicid also blocks this URAT or URAT1 transporter. Okay. Truth is, um, all three of these are considered organic anion transporters. Now, URAT1 is important for taking the uh, filtered uric acid and reabsorbing it. That's why I have a larger arrow going out of the urine or out of the filtrate and into the epithelial cell. Whereas O1 and O3, um, there's a lot of evidence showing that O1 and O3 can take uric acid from the paratubular capillaries and actually pump it, right, pump it into the epithelial cell. And the next step would be then uh, movement from the epithelial cell into the lumen. So the main point I'm getting at here is that O1 and O3 directly oppose urat one and um, some, some, a dirty little secret about probenicid is that it actually block, when again, when it blocks O1 and O3, um, it does that with quite a high affinity. And the truth is, there's evidence that if you have a subtherapeutic dose of probenicid 
you can actually worsen your uric acid levels or increase them. And um, I'm not I'm not going to say it's proven, but this will help I think to understand or to remember that that happens at a subtherapeutic dose. You don't potentially just get um, kind of a, a low efficacy. A subtherapeutic dose of prevenicid could potentially worsen your gout, and that's because it's going to inhibit O1 and O3. And by doing that, you would actually prevent secretion of uric acid, then raising the blood level of uric acid. Now, the reason why that happens is only at a subtherapeutic dose is because once you reach a therapeutic dose, you'll start inhibiting urate 1 or urate 1. You'll inhibit that, and you'll still be inhibiting these two. But when you inhibit all three of them, uh, because humans are better reabsorbers of uric acid than secretors, the net effect is that you get better uric acid elimination or excretion than you would without probenicid. Okay, so you this is a dominating transporter for, for uric acid. So we block that. Uh, with the therapeutic dose, we block all these transporters, and the net effect is efficacy. Now this is really just um, the same concept, kind of zoomed in, kind of a different way of looking at it. Um, but I'm not going to go into all these other transporters really, except um, this one I threw in here, GLUT9, because um, a study came out a few years ago indicating um, they're, they're looking at genetics in Italy, in um, Sardinia, in Chianti, two different regions of Italy, and they found that GLUT9, um, this kind of came out of nowhere, but GLUT9 uh, was shown to be very, again, this, trans, this is a transporter, shown to be very kind of um, predictive of whether or not uh, someone uh, would have a essentially a high uric acid concentration and seemed to be somewhat predictive of, of the your incidence of gout or risk for gout. So even though this is labeled as a glucose transporter, the ironic thing is it doesn't seem to transport sugars at all. It primarily seems to transport uric acid. So uh, the reason why I bring this up is because this could potentially be a drug target in the future. And I just would like you to be prepared and understanding that if something comes out as a GLUT9 inhibitor, then you'll have an idea of why. Um, and a good example of, of something like that that happens is the drug Invokana um, and some of the other drugs that him inhibit SGLT2 um, in the kidney. Um, I don't have that transporter on here, but SGLT2 would also be in these cells. And inhibiting that um, glucose transporter on the apical membrane actually prevents reabsorption. So it would be over here that would prevent reabsorption of glucose to cause enhanced glucose excretion. So they are moving towards transporter inhibitors um, as medications. Um, of course, that doesn't come without its own issues, which I won't get into now. Okay, so again, here's the narrative. This helps you. Um, if you missed anything, this will help you kind of pick up where you might have missed or had any gaps. Okay, um, and here's the article I'm citing here. Um, from 2007, so not that recent, but not that old either. So the GLUT9 gene being associated with serum uric acid levels in Sardinia and Chianti cohorts. So believe it or not, Chianti is not just a beverage, and the name is apparently coming from um, this region of Italy. And I think Sardinia was Sardinia is the island off of Italy, which is part of Italy. Um, so they took relatively genetically distinct populations and they found that both of those had a uric acid level pre predicted by their GLUT9 genotype which told us told us it's quite important for um, to, you know determining uric acid concentrations so actually to the now we'll get to the uric acid drugs so it's easy easy from this point on because we already talked about the physiology okay and actually some of the pharmacology but um, this is probenicid. It's a very small molecule, um, kind of a typical drug size molecule. It has a carboxylic acid. It has a, um, this is a sulfone, okay? And yes, you can get sulfur allergies with this. That is a possibility for people that have that allergy, okay? But that's not really going to be the focus of this discussion. Um, 
So again, I want you to know that it does inhibit URAT1, and that's that's this therapeutic mechanism of action. But it does inhibit OAT1 and OAT3, which kind of opposes a therapeutic action. So it's not a drug with, you know, a perfect specificity that, you know, does only positive things. The net outcome is, yes, positive effects, um, but it does have some conflicting um, or contrasting effects as well. Okay. It's a little bit more detail, but I already kind of discussed all this. Okay, um, and the reason why this works, like I mentioned, uh, the reason why probenicid works is because uric acid is primarily reabsorbed in humans. Okay, so reabsorption predominates in humans. So if we inhibit reabsorption, we can enhance excretion of uric acid. Um, this is FYI, but the official gene name for uric one is SLC twenty two A twelve. Um, SLC standing for solute carrier. Okay, so that's pretty common. Um, you'll see it's called SLC for uh, really almost all transporters. I shouldn't say that, but as many transporters in the body will be SLCs. Okay, not just in in humans. Okay. So uh, this is a little bit of extra trivia. You don't necessarily need to know this, uh, but you're at one is an exchanger. It does require a counter substrate in order to um, take up um, uric acid. So some other anions will be pumped out to bring in uric acid. Okay. Um, something else um, that's quite interesting is probenicid was developed. Believe it or not, probenicid was developed during World War II uh, when penicillin um, was not as easy to come by as it is now. So penicillin supplies were getting quite low in, in uh, World War II. Um, and they discovered that if you give probenicid to someone taking penicillin, you could prolong the residence time. So that was a really nice, uh, smart way of increasing um, the essentially the efficiency and utility of penicillin. So give it, you know, giving one dose, you can make it last longer in a in a soldier than than you would, you know, using probenicid than without probenicid. And um, I'd like to just mention that in grad school, probably my biggest finding um, or my biggest discovery was that when we're using um, OAT3 or O3 knockout mice, which means um, they don't, we've deleted, essentially deleted the gene organic anion transporter 3 in the kidney, um, we found that um, the, these mice, after, after about 30 minutes, uh, after administration of penicillin G, um, their blood concentration of penicillin was five times higher um, when they when they did not have O3 or when we deleted O3. So that that kind of confirmed that probenicid um, the the means by which it raises penicillin concentrations or or prevents elimination is almost definitely because of O3. And um, I was kind of excited to to kind of prove that O3 is that important in probenicid. Um, Probenicid's ability to maintain the residence of penicillin in the blood. Okay, so moving back to the focus here, side effects. Uh, pro this is probenicid specifically. Uh, upset stomach, drowsiness, vertigo, tinnitus. Truth is, you can see that um, in some patients with most drugs. Okay, increased urination, sore gums, and, and edema. Uh, potential anemia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia. And yes, it's sulfa allergy, okay, and that's going to occur not on the first time administered, gener generally with re-administration, like most allergies. Okay, so um, we're getting close to the end here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on um, the anti-inflammatory agents because you've had these before, and you'll see them again, um, especially the NSAIDs. So I'll get into the most important topics on uh, NSAIDs. Uh, but for now, I want to talk about, again, uh, colchicine, which really has gout as its only indication, okay? Something I find, and you know, I don't get into a lot of um, a lot of this extraneous trivia, but I think this is interesting because sometimes I'll see these uh, flowers even around campus. Um, colchicine comes from the autumn crocus plant. It's these very simple purple flowers you'll find from time to time. There are many different crocuses which probably look very similar to the autumn crocus. So, I, you know, sometimes I'm not 100% sure if it's the autumn crocus that I'm looking at. Um, 
but this is where culture scene comes from and, and to me the interesting thing on top of that is kind of ironic that um, or coincidence that this autumn crocus is also where we get saffron um, the spice saffron as you most of you know in my class I like cooking the spice saffron is really the most expensive spice in the world and that comes from comes from scraping off the pollen on um, on this the little um, I'm forgetting my flower anatomy okay probably the pistol right scraping off um, that pollen on there um, essentially is when you're getting that's how you're gonna get your saffron um, and you're probably have to gonna have you're probably gonna have to have acres and acres of these to get enough to really make make some money on that I think it's kind of interesting so the mechanism of culture scene um, again uh, culture scene is actually so it, it's actually cytotoxic it's so toxic that the dosage that you'll see um, and I'm not going to talk about dosage uh, specific in specific numbers right now but it's a very low dosage okay and that's because it's it's actually cytotoxic uh, believe it or not culture scene was also looked at as an anti-cancer drug but it's not used for that and that's because it's an anti-mitotic drug so it prevents mitosis um, and not only does it prevent mitosis um, but actually this might be more important it prevents um, it actually prevents the formation of microtubules and that's the means by which it prevents mitosis but microtubules um, I'm not sure what you remember about microtubules um, you know other than structural support for cells but microtubules have a lot of other important functions and one of them is serving as a mode of transportation for vesicles so microtubules um, transport and release uh, vesicles containing inflammatory mediators so that's um, white blood cell um, essentially used in white blood cells uh, for releasing inf inflammatory mediators the vesicles um, traveling on microtubules are also very important for releasing neurotransmitters so perhaps it's not surprising that um, by blocking microtubule formation we could actually reduce inflammation so that's the therapeutic uh, mechanism but we can also cause a side effect which is peripheral neuropathy and the theory there is that by blocking microtubule production um, we're going to have trouble getting neurotrans proper neurotransmitter release potentially causing um, essentially ne neuronal symptoms such as peripheral neuropathy potentially pins and needles um, numbness in uh, the distal uh, digits and things like that, the limbs. Um, so the nice thing is we're going to decrease the release of lactic acid from leukocytes um, by preventing uh, vesicle uh, budding with the membrane. That's going to raise the local pH and remember raising the pH is going to increase alkalinity thus enhancing solubility of the uric acid crystals. Okay, um, and I have this statement in here apparently not effective for other forms of inflammation. That may not be true, but um, culture scene is really not used for anything else. Okay, so perhaps because we have things that are less toxic. Um, side effects, yes, they're quite extensive because, you know, uh, mitosis is used so uh, ubiquitously in the body for cell division. So any cells that divide rapidly will be affected. So intestinal mucosal damage potentially bone marrow suppression so we can get low blood cell counts um, alopecia or hair loss because of um, hair follicle proliferation being uh, prevented okay so the gastrointestinal effects um, 80 percent of patients will get these um, these are early warning signs of toxicity uh, you generally would discontinue the drug for some period of time and then perhaps uh, re-administer it later you can get nausea vomiting diarrhea and abdominal pain burning in the throat, potentially bloody diarrhea, okay, bone marrow suppression as I mentioned, and alopecia. Renal effects, you can get bloody urine or hematuria, uh, little urine, urine production or oliguria. Again, drowsiness, um, and I didn't mention that, but that's one effect. Peripheral neuropathy, again, related to the microtubules. Finally, I want to talk about pretty much the meat and potatoes of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. So we're talking um, indomethacin. I include aspirin because its mechanism um, is the same target. So indomethacin, aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen, ketoprofen, 
um, uh, Ketorolac, so many other ones. Okay, we have um, indomethacin is actually one of the common ones used uh, for gout, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, well, I might as well talk about it now. Um, indomethacin seems to be better um, at alleviating the inflammation related to gout. And um, again, this is kind of a, a tangent or side note, but from my research, um, I know that indomethacin is very good at inhibiting um, the, urate, the urate transporter, urat one And from a clinical side, that's not really discussed very often, but the reality is um, there's a lot of evidence indicating that indomethacin can, can block urat one So um, whether or not this is well recognized, the truth is it's very likely that indomethacin not only reduces inflammation through COX-1 inhibition, um, but indomethacin probably blocks uric acid reabsorption. Uh, we know it does that in cell lines. We know it does it in certain animals. Um, but whether or not it actually does that as a therapeutic mechanism in humans probably could be should be studied. But the truth is, it's very likely that that's that's why it has such um, such you know good acceptance uh, for for treating gout. Side effects of NSAIDs, okay, are going to be gastrointestinal. Of course, we can get ulcers. Just a quick reminder, uh, people that get ulcers from NSAIDs often get them, well, not often, but for the most part, ulcers from NSAIDs occur not from the NSAID damaging the luminal or um, the apical side of the gastric mucosa directly, but remember NSAIDs actually when they travel through the bloodstream they can they can prevent uh, protective prostaglandin production in the stomach. So really that this can happen with IV NSAIDs um, even enteric coated NSAIDs can cause ulcers because they get into the bloodstream, they get behind the parietal cells, okay, block um, prostaglandin, uh, PGE2 and I2 production, and, and actually it's that what I should say is that it's preventing mucus and bicarbonate secretion um, through the gastric mucosal cells by blocking prostaglandin production. So you're going to you're going to thin the gastric mucus and prevent neutralization of gastric acid leading to ulcers. Um, to confound that or complicate that, uh, NSAIDs also have an antiplatelet effect. When they block thromboxane A2, remember thromboxane A2 is pro-platelet um, pro activation. So if you block thromboxane A2 production, because that's a prostaglandin, um, you increase the risk of bleeding. So you combine that with a, an increased risk of an ulcer, there's kind of a perfect storm there if you have a high dose of an NSAID for a long period of time for the most part. Renal effects, it's again related to, you know, a lot of the renal effects are related to prostaglandin, um, reduced prostaglandin synthesis. Again, um, kind of PGE2 and PGI2 again, when you block PGE2 and PGI2 production, you can uh, kind of reverse the dilation of the afferent arterioles um, causing afferent arterial or constriction. That means you're going to block or, or reduce blood flow to the glomeruli, and that means you're going to um, reduce uh, creatinine clearance, reduce blood uh, blood filtration. That's going to raise the fluid uh, fluid level in the body. So you're going to fluid retention and even diminish sodium excretion and some other effects. We can get NSAID allergies and uterine effects, so delayed parturition and slowed or difficult delivery can occur. <clears throat> and finally, um, an exciting new agent, and this is where, and if you haven't figured it out already, I'll alleviate the suspense here, um, peglodicase or Crestexa is finally a drug on the market that replaces what humans are lacking, and that's the uricase enzyme. So it's, it's actually not very common to find a new drug on the market that is an enzyme that we don't already have in our body, and that is what this is. So peglodicase is pegylated uricase, okay? And pegylation is kind of, um, I always laugh when I see this prefix on a word um, because it's polyethylene glycol, so it's actually kind of sophisticated word here. 
polyethylene glycolated uricase. And all that means is, yes, it's, it's a polyethylene glycol that you use in pharmaceutics lab, okay, that you see in Miralax and other products. This polyethylene glycol has been shown to quite significantly increase the half-life of peglodicase, okay, from hours to over a week. So that's very useful. Okay, so um, instead of multiple injections, we can give one, um, one uh, it's a slow IV infusion, but we could, they could do that um, much less frequently than if it weren't pegylated. And remember, pegylation also is intended to reduce the immunogenicity of the enzyme, and there's some evidence to support that. So essentially, we're replacing uh, something that we don't have, again, that's the uricase, that the non- great apes, right, all their mammals have this uricase other than the great apes, okay, um, and that is, is what this drug is, it's a uricase for conversion of uric acid into allantoin, so it's going to enhance our body's ability to convert, um, or really it's going gonna, it's gonna to give our body the new ability to convert uric acid to allantoin, okay, so it's that final step in the pathway that we're finally giving to humans so we can form this very water-soluble metabolite and, and easily readily eliminate it. Now, <clears throat> this doesn't this drug doesn't come without issues. Now, this is reported directly by the manufacturer. Anaphylaxis and effusion reactions are common, 6.5 percent of patients. Now, that's a kind of a subjective statement, but 6.5 percent of patients in clinical trials experienced anaphylaxis despite proper pre-medication with antihistamines and steroids, and or steroids. So anytime you have a drug that can cause allergies, you very often would want to give um, steroids and or antihistamines like diphenhydramine. And they, they, sh they reported that even though they did that, um, even then 6.5% of patients had allergic reactions. And um, that was listed as anaphylaxis reactions, which are kind of severe. Um, so some of the things you can see as a side effect of anaphylax or a manifestation of anaphylaxis would be um, perioral edema, so edema near the maybe near the the gums or the mouth, hemodynamic instability, so changes in blood pressure, heart rate, uh, potentially rash or hives, worse than some, um, especially if you don't premedicate. Um, higher uric acid. So this is something. I had to read this a few times to start understanding or, or kind of grasping what this means. Higher uric acid levels have been reported to correlate with a greater risk for these in, uh, actually anaphylactic infusion reactions. Um, so what that means is that patients that have a higher uric acid burden um, have a higher risk of getting allergic reactions um, or infusion reactions um, to peglodicase. Okay, so that um, that actually is, of course, kind of a, in my opinion, kind of a problem uh, because you would think um, you get the most utility out of a drug uh, when your uric acid levels are higher, um, when there's plenty of room to drop those levels down to a therapeutic concentration or healthy concentration. So the manufacturer recommends. Um, that if uric acid is above six milligrams per deciliter in the blood, potentially consider discontinuation of peglodicase. Okay, so that um, in that statement as well uh, makes it a little bit hard to understand exactly when you'd be using this medication. Um, I imagine some people would be using it as a last line option when other medications aren't aren't working very well. Okay. Uh, very important to remember from a practical standpoint, um, peglodicase was only given intravenously, never, it's never given by IV push or IV bolus, so never rapidly given. It's always by slow infusion because of the risk of infusion reactions and um, anaphylaxis. Okay, so that wraps up uh, the lecture. It looks like I, um, I actually went for a little bit less, maybe 10 minutes less than I would if I were um, present physically in class. Um, so I'll save a little bit of time, I guess. So what I did, as I, as I usually try to do, is um, I've given you 
self-assessment questions, okay, and I'll provide you the answers um, in a, a timely manner uh, after you guys have time to go through these self-assessment questions, okay. So there's not too many, only 10, okay, to kind of reflect um, kind of a small, kind of a short, small lecture, okay. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions or um, any input or feedback to improve the lecture, uh, just let me know. Uh, thank you very much.